we've seen geographically and that they mean in terms of time as well. From Brisbane and uh, windless nice weather to the Roman past in Scotland, probably windy and wet. Um, and I'm not sure I'm going to do much justice to the project in 15 minutes or how much depth. But I think it's interesting and I can see the logic of this really nicely organized conference of all the case studies in this session, because I think in different ways we're all talking about using digital to interpret and engage with different audiences without leaving aside documentation, historical authenticity, accuracy. So some of, these are some of the themes I'd like to pick up in my talk. Um, as you heard, this is a Horizon 2020 project, so we're working across Europe with different partners. Um, trying to address one of the problems that I think different speakers touched upon in different ways today, that uh, it's a lot of digital work as well as interpretation work in digital heritage, but there still um, doesn't seem to be a coherent framework or um, a systematic and well-studied and research model about defining the emotive experience for cultural heritage. So, Although a lot of different users from different perspectives uh, are invited and encouraged by all our different institutions to engage with our sites, with our objects, with our collections, in our care, um, there's increasing talk in the field about the need to also emotionally engage with them. So I was very pleased to hear about love letters rather than conference presentations and get the passion and the love about what we do coming out uh, in the room here today. And that's what Emotive tries, therefore, the name as well, try to look at how digital storytelling, using also different tools within that, for example, AR, VR, 3D modeling, um, can underpin and encourage emotional engagement with some, um, in this case, uh, the Antonine Wall collection of the Hadiria Museum and the related UNESCO sites. There's also another heritage site from Chatham Yug, the prehistoric one in Turkey. But I'm going to talk to focus, because we only have 15 minutes, on the one in the Hatian, where uh, most of um, the research of me and my team um, is currently taking place. And Hilary couldn't be here today because she's actually carrying out some of the evaluations in the gallery that couldn't take place for practical reasons last week. So we tried here to move away a little bit of problematic we think model of the didactic where it could be state of the art digital and I think we've all been impressed by the quality of the digital today throughout the different talks. But I still find quite disheartening how uh, in some cases virtual museums or other digital applications in cultural heritage can still have a quite traditional and quite limiting interpretation model in the way they try to communicate about the past. So we're trying to test and research here um, how we can cut across and fill some of the gaps and the disconnect from emotions. Um, so we, some of the key concepts of emotive, apart from using interactive forms of storytelling, um, it's also trying to connect and use universal themes. And I'll show you an example when I talk about one of the stories we designed um, in a few minutes. So we uh, also use within the project and across the consortium the idea of the continuous exhibition space. So although it's a bit confusing sometimes the definitions, in our case on-site means inside the museum gallery in the Hatinia. On-site in other cases could be outside of the museum on the archaeological sites that cut across from one end of Scotland to the other for the Antonite wall. Uh, but the idea within the consortium was also to use digital to talk also about museum interpretation inside um, the confines of the four walls, but also online and also to talk about uh, when we're talking about the Chatham or the Antonine Wall, when you're actually outside uh, in the archaeological sites themselves. So to, to look at the challenges and questions and potential across all the different areas. But it's also a lot of focus on visitor uh, analysis and evaluation and how people actually use um, the sites. In case you haven't been to Glasgow, um, and because this is the project's a three year Horizon 2020, we still have a bit more than a year to go. Uh, it would be great, we're still doing evaluation, we're looking at feedback, um, so please do come and, and let us know, and we can uh, try it out. And, and, evaluate you to death, do interviews and get your feedback hopefully in the process. 
So just very briefly some of the rationale before the story and behind it before I talk a little bit more about it. We wanted to connect, as I mentioned, as with all museum displays, there's the challenge of museum interpretation that we're taking objects outside their original context uh, and we were trying to see whether digital can help us reconnect and bring a little bit some of the archaeological context of the site in the gallery for the visitors there. Uh, the one I'm going to talk today is not the online one, but it's the one that happens in the museum, the story visitors see when they go around. So one of our key challenges and aims were to connect with the objects you see around you, to not isolate people in front of the little screens, but help use those, the digital story, to understand and reinterpret what's around them in the gallery. I mentioned universal themes before because we're trying to target also audiences that are not necessarily very traditional museum ones and talk about things that are relevant for them today, like family, loss, love, and make them think that it's not necessarily all that different when um, you're talking about some of the likes and some of the stories around the underlying wall in Roman Britain. There's different branching points so people can follow what they want to um, what interests them through the story. Um, and as I mentioned before, emotional engagement and trying to encourage empathy with some of the characters was um, one of our aims and trying to test how this would work out. We wanted in the process as well to challenge some of the stereotypes and encourage a critical understanding and thinking of the past, for example, that it wasn't all about fighting the life of a Roman soldier and preparing for war, but it was probably much more complex interaction with the locals the Caledonian sort of tribes and um, what was taking place between them, despite the fact we don't have that much information um, from the historic sources, but trying to bring in some of the archaeological historical record and combine it with the storytelling. And there lies, I think, the challenge and what I wanted to mainly raise with the talk today, where exactly do you draw the line and you still keep one without losing the other. We use different uh, kind of tools within the story, the 360 panoramas, NFC tags, and models, but I don't want to focus so much on the technical side today. But I think because we're towards the afternoon, I think it's uh, a question to raise this um, balance between archaeological, historical record and documentation that a lot of speakers uh, talked about today uh, with um, the immersion in the story and the engagement in the interpretation of the storytelling. There was a lot of work from the design process in terms of prototyping and storming in the museum and with different both creative industry and cultural heritage professionals who brought aim to help us uh, in, in this. Um, and although it was hard work, it was a lot of fun as you can see as well. It, wasn't, uh, it was very interesting to try out some of the stories in the museum. Uh, and there was a lot of testing of the methodology there in terms of the evaluation as well, um, how we can move beyond the usability, that an awful lot of this is uh, taking place at the moment and try to capture some of the small complex issues I'm talking about in terms of user experience, the engagement, what they're getting out of it, how it affects them and impacts them also after the experience in their lives. So by definition, line, it had to be a combination of qualitative and quantitative to capture this complexity and a lot of different methodologies that we use. So moving now into the story, um, the one we have completed, the beta version, is Bushish's Dilemma. We're in the process of designing another one. But I'm going to use this. These are early versions we tried out um, and talk about um, some of the lessons learned there and some of the issues that this raised. Um, because audio is an important part of the story. This is a bush so I'm going to try and see if it works. I'm a British. I was a soldier with the Roman army at the Antonine Wall. Around you in the museum were some of the things we left behind. From then, experts decipher where we lived, the food we ate, the clothes we wore. They can tell you what we worked at, how we relaxed, the way we fought. But they can't tell you about my feelings. They don't know what I dreamt about or who I loved, what made my pulse quicken or my heart sing, and no one knows my own personal stories. But you can discover some of these here. You can rescue me from obscurity and reveal my stories. You can make me live again. Okay. 
That was because this is a research project. It's not, um, we don't have money to do a high-end production. The voice was really one of the students at the University of Glasgow doing English. Thankfully, the drama society, uh, one of their best actors, so her Craig, he has one year of his uh, degree before he graduates, and he was so good, it was very interesting for me to see this 20 year old looking quite young. The minute we gave him the script, he became a pushers with his voice, and it worked quite well with, with the testing. Um, though that's, uh, I don't have time to go into voices and accents and how does that affect user experience, but I thought. I'll just play very quickly that clip uh, because the rest is just some of the screenshots. So Bushes, and the reason we chose him um, was because we do have at the museum a uh, hammerhead with the name of Bushes scribbled on it, scratched on it. So we know uh, it's part of the collection, part of the objects that people can see on display. Um, but how much of what we put in the story is actually historical, archaeological fact? And when do you start bringing in some of the storytelling and dramatization moving into the fiction? Um, is the question. So, we don't have time to go through all the details, and I have to give something for you as an incentive to come to the Hunter and try this out. But you can see already a little bit of the language. That's the main menu on the right. His life's work, or the love of his life. We're trying to stay with the theme of personal stories um, to connect some of the objects on display. So, uh, for example, this is one of the distance labs that we have there, and you can use some of the 360 or floor plan to try to locate um, where it is in the museum to go around. This is not a trail, there's not a linear path, you don't have to follow every single object. Uh, and the different options in the story. Um, these are some of the 3D models that Historic Environment Scotland very kindly lent to us so we didn't have to reinvent the wheel. And we gave them access to the collections, they gave us access to the 3D objects, so it was very nicely mutually beneficial, I think, <laughs> relationship um, to allow us to move on on the things that we're more interested in this case with the research project on how does the story work or not, and how does it, what's the effect and the impact of different visitors. This is, this is the hammerhead I mentioned, you cannot really see what was written on that. And that's part of the information you also get. So there's a lot of research underpinning this that we obviously did before we wrote the story, but we tried to interweave and put it in um, without destroying some of the immersion and the engagement. So this is uh, one of the board games that we have on display as well, and there's different objects. And um, I don't have time to play for you um, Kale, who's the female local Caledonian, and the relationship that they have. When, um, and I won't tell you if this is the conjecture of the fact, I think I, I leave it up to you to think about it. But throughout, this is called the Bushes of Dilemma, the story, and you have to decide uh, as a user whether the Romans are about to retreat and move further south to the Hadrian Wall and desert the Antonine Wall, and whether Bushes, who has been living there for quite a few years and has formed a relationship with Kali and they have a son together, should he desert his family and go with the Roman army or become a deserter and stay with the family. Uh, and after you choose that, you see the different, um, uh, he, this different text related to that. Um, we're trying to work on the story so that you can see what other people have um, selected. After all the story, we added that the beta version. We added what are the facts behind the story to try to explain and put some of the questions there. Was it which is real? Um, were there really women and children on the wall? For example, you see at the far right, uh, these are some of the shoes we found from Barhill. There were hundreds of those, and there were sizes that were also female and children, it's not just male, which led the archaeologists and historians um, believe that there was um, not just male soldiers there, but it was much more complex than what was happening along the fort. So, by putting them at the end of the story, um, trying to evaluate with different user groups there. It was interesting for us, one of the key challenges was try to maintain the engagement and the immersion, but also not forget about the facts. Um, 
and I'm not, um, because this was an experiment we're still evaluating, I don't claim that this was the ideal way, but after a lot of discussions and testing, most people agree that it should be at the, at the end of the story after people had selected what they want and how they want to go through it. So, um, I think it's very interesting for us, we're trying to incorporate in our next story, allowing visitors to ask us the stories they think they might be interested, because we find from experience a lot of interesting surprises sometimes from different user groups. We are now working with Barracuda, who's a female character and younger one, which we think is important to connect with our different personas um, and try different narrative cultures there. For example, about identity, she's a local Caledonian, as well as some of the technical 3D tools um, and using VR to try to connect the museum to the underlying world. So I will leave you there with a the question about what is the perfect way, and I think the answer is probably that a lot of different ways, depending on the context, to combine the fact, the fact and the fiction in some heritage interpretation. So thank you very much, and I'll finish there.